Hello, and welcome to Locutors of Trek. Supplemental. The podcast where we talk about the people, places, and things of Star Trek. So, grab yourself a snail juice or an Andorian ale, and join us far beyond the stars. Locutors of Trek. Program initiated. Enter when ready. Well, hi there. It's Dave here. And I'm Davin. We are Locutors of Trek. And Plain Simple Tailors. You can catch us on uh, Facebook, yep. uh, YouTube. We have our on-screen segments. Oh, we love the tubes. We love the tubes. You can catch us on Twitch as well. You can even reach out and talk to us at uh, sure. Locutors of Trek at Gmail. We're loquacious. We are. Tonight, we talk faces. Oh, yes. Many faces. In fact, the many faces of, I think, what, what Trek's maybe most multifarious actor, if not one of the most multifarious actors. He's not the most. That would be uh, Vaughn Armstrong. Oh, right. Right. Fair enough. But his, uh, he didn't have as many significant roles. I mean, that's true. Other than uh, Admiral Forrest. That is a great role, though. But yeah, one of the one of the actors who's played the most and some of the most significant roles, as you say, oh, the beloved Jeffrey Combs, born uh, in Oxnard, California. Indeed, Jeffrey Allen Combs, born in Oxnard, California, in 1954. He's uh, known all over TV and film. He's a, often a character actor. He's been Herbert West reanimator. He's actually played Lovecraft himself at various points. He's been all over the place and tends to play as we find often eccentric or psychotic characters because a great villain he's a wonderful character actor but uh, any character just insanely diverse range yeah yeah we'll you can play a variety of, uh, of, of moods that's exactly mm-hmm. right um a real man of a thousand faces that way mm-hmm. he um learned some of his craft at Santa Maria's Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts, also in the Professional Actors Training Program at the University of Washington. So a lot of West Coast learning there. And then moved down uh, through playhouses and things on the West Coast and found his way to Los Angeles. And his first role, it turns out, was Honky Tonk Freeway in 1981, where he plays an unnamed drive-in teller. It was all uphill from there. Let's call him Jeffrey. Let's call him Jeffrey. Yeah, within within uh, a few years, he was landing TV roles, and then we soon got to meet him in a 1994, I think, or 1994, 95, in the third season of Deep Space Nine. Yeah, he saves this episode because the A plot, probably my least favorite in all of Deep Space not, Nine. Not particularly memorable. Um, Meridian, uh, the one where... Um, Jedzy is afraid to climb a couple feet up a tree and uh, other terribly romantic moments. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not the best day plot. And it's like, you know, I'm going to su- go on a quick tangent about Meridian for a second. To me, it's the um, uh, threshold of Deep Space Nine. Because as you know, huh. threshold starts off with, I think, a great premise, the sort of desire to get to warp 10. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then, you know, goes off the rails in terms of just salamanders and, you know. Yes. But this one is sort of like that because I like the uh, initial premise where there's this planet that just, um, due to something to do with their own sun, slips out of phase and they Mm -hmm. become pure consciousness for 60 years. And then they come back and everything's exactly how they left it. That could be a a very interesting episode. And then they they just kind of did a terribly forced romance plot with it instead mm-hmm. but but in the b plot of that episode we do have tyran or tyran or what i'm not sure how you pronounce mm-hmm. it exactly. and he's he's had an, an, an encounter with kira at, at, at the bar one night and he enjoyed his conversation with her he thought they had a great talk now she comes to say that he was doing all the talking uh, yeah he has he has he develops a certain kind of fixation with her really he, he uh, does. And, you may uh, say an unhealthy one yeah, and you know when Quark dissuades him about trying anything like that, lest he become hideously injured. Um, <laughs> so pick anybody else, but Q. Yeah, this just is... just don't go there, buddy. She uh, might even hurt me for you talking to me about this right now. <laughs> yeah, he's he's happy to settle on a hollow program. 
Yeah. Which, of course, leads to one of the most searingly weird images in all of Deep Space Nine, which is Quark's head on uh, <laughs> an entirely oh. unfamiliar body for his head. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, that's uh you can't unsee it. No. Um, you just gave me a very uh sharp image of it and it's like that's true. not the stick. last time they gender swap quark though. No, no. It's just it's definitely not his body in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's just definitely not his body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he's just like, I'll make you any program you want, any holiday program you want. If it doesn't exist, it'll be expensive, but I'll make it for you. He's like, I want Kira. He's like, Kira. What do you want with Kira? No, no, wait, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's 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 just sorted. The but whole it's thing. funny. His plan, like to get Kira into the holodeck so he can scan her image, give maybe oh, yeah. her the one millionth customer. And she just hates everything to do with Quark. She's like, I don't, I don't want to be your one millionth customer. Make make him your one millionth customer. <laughs> He's like, that would be dishonest, Major. Gives him the free holodeck, and she gives it away to. The, yeah, whose birthday it is, some ensign. So that's pretty funny. But yeah, Tehran, he, he, it's an interesting way to uh, introduce Jeffrey Combs to the DS9. Yeah, audience. but his uh, the the quality of his voice on that episode is lovely. The sort of like uh, very light but menacing voice that uh, Tehran has because mm. he really he doesn't do a lot of sort of display of anything particularly intimidating but he is for sure an absolutely menacing character particularly in his interactions with quark no he just threatened to ruin quark yeah you know he is in a sense stalking kira oh he's just he's a thoroughly nasty guy yeah uh anything else you want to say about Tehran? oh i love the face makeup it is great it's a great piece of uh piece of uh visual effect yeah and he did get out of the episode without being severely hurt by Kira, which is pretty good. That's true. That's true. Pride some, stoved yeah. right in there, but you know, it has some survival instincts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I guess uh, uh, next up would be Brat FCA. Ah, liquidator Brat C A. Oh man, Liquid. I think the sequences involving Quark's closet. <laughs> are some of my favorite in Deep Space Nine. <laughs> They're like oh. absolutely like a real beautiful send up of like a 1960s sitcom, right? Like yeah. Bewitched or something where he's just like appearing in the closet. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, I think that is in his first appearance. In his first appearance is when he's come to a form court very... that Moogie is making profit. I thought he had tried to take him out once before that. Oh, did he with the Nagus? Yeah. Oh, I think you might Something be right like about that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but, when he, uh, yeah, there, when there he, are interactions when, always when very named Nagus for like a, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, and then he comes back about Moogie to get sort of revenge. Yeah, it makes a yeah. memorable appearance saving Moogie later. True. Yeah, in the magnificent Ferengi. Mm, oh, well, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> the the horrible use they make of that. Or uh, that poor corpse, anyway. He, he basically does end up with sort of an obsession to destroy Quark. Yeah, yeah. It is a nice nod to Herbert West Reanimator, though. Who? That they, that they, they drive... Uh, I forget the uh, the Vorta's name. They have the Which dead one? Vorta, and they, like, remote control drive... Oh, Keybon? Yeah. Yeah, Keybon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is funny not to be animator, actually. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that till just now. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He should have been all over that. Why do you need an eliminator? No. <laughs> but uh, it's funny oh, the yeah. scene of him on Frangenar at Quark's, at Moogie's house, too. When he walks in and is like, remember, my house is my house, and ours, as are its contents. <laughs> <laughs> And the movie's like, get out of my house. Maybe you should just leave. And Brunt's just like stunned. And he's just like looking around at like Rom and Cork. He's like, what's happening here? Is that female <laughs> speaking to me? Yeah, he's a he's a very traditional Ferengi. That's a for traditional sure. guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's got his heart in the in the homeland. Or home in the heartland. Who knows? Uh, Brunt. 
Yeah. And then, uh, and then there's, of course, the Magnificent Fring. Yeah. And then there's the one where he shows up just to help Quark fight against the, his striking workers, really. Because it's... Oh, yeah. That's right. So, yeah, that's a great they're on the same side. You know, when uh, when Prophet is on the line. Or, you know, uh, Ferengi Law. Sure. In, sure. In his role as liquidator. But, but he's he's just such a great character, Brent. If, oh yeah, I, I I love every scene he's in. Oh, and he's he's a real he's a he's a really delicious sort of antagonist, in that you know he really is a rules monger. He, but he's able to recognize sort of when he's beaten at his own game and back off. Like he's a really interesting character that can make repeat appearances, mm-hmm. uh, and they really make the most of him. I think. And possibly the most overt of all these characters in, in, in what he's trying to accomplish and stuff. He's, oh, yeah. He's just like, I'm here to ruin you, Quark. Oh, and of course, maybe the best episode with Brunt might be body parts, where he sets the whole thing up for, you know, he needs, so Quark has to kill himself to get the vacuum desiccated Quark. To, oh, that's because right. Because he sold it all to Brunt. <laughs> That was, oh, that was, that was his, him at his most maniacal. Yeah. First yeah. make Quark think he's going to die, which is already, you know, messing with his mind. Yeah, uh, pretty awful. But then, but yeah. then make it killing off him. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. Make him witness his death via G- Garrick in the holodeck like a hundred times. Oh, yes. Oh, what a great sequence. Falling yeah. into his dinner plate, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Oh, man. What was that wrong was with poison fun. again? The problem with poison is it doesn't work. If I know the food has poison in it, I won't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so couldn't you just put it in there and not tell him? I don't know. I didn't get that. <laughs> I just yeah. don't think he wanted to be yeah, poisoned. I don't think uh, by that point, Quark's not particularly thinking clearly, I don't think. But well, now. the magnificent Ferengi, so a, a, a great true. hero of the Empire. Well, next up is uh, Hue, well, Hue, well, Hueun Four, I guess. Yeah, I think Hueun Four is the first one we see, isn't he? In um, it's the one with uh, the Jem'Hadar who have gone rogue, right? And they have to work together, the Federation and uh, the Jem'Hadar. It's 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 pretty good. I like that episode. Yeah. But he he dies in that episode, so Hueun Four only lasts for one episode. Yes. Yeah. Hi, they they have great they have a great deal of fun killing Wayun. Well, they didn't plan on bringing him back. He was just supposed to be another one off character like Tehran. Right. Yeah, but uh, you know, so he did such a good job. I feel like that's what happened with Tehran. They're like, dang, that was pretty good. We need to find another guy. Yeah, and then you have Brunt, and then it's like, oh, yeah, we can't bring Brunt in every week. What about what about another character for Jeffrey? It's like, it's like let's put him in the Dominion now. This this will work. Yeah. And we'll make Wei him a clone. Is a fabulous character. Because uh, we do, we get to, we, I mean, we have the people's satisfaction. I think maybe his funniest death may be at Damara's hands. Uh, <laughs> that's just a great moment. Uh, you just see the satisfaction on Damara's face. Damara's killed two Wayuns, we think. Because he's also <laughs> the one in the shuttle accident. Oh, that's true. I forgot about that. He's yeah. at least arranged his death, that's for sure. I can, yeah, I can only imagine how much that would please Damar. Damar probably hates Wayun more than any other character. Yeah, I <laughs> think so. Not like Wayuns, and he was forced to deal with him every day. Oh yeah. Who's and your I favorite mean, Wayun? Oh. Four, five. Wayun? Six, no, I think Wayun seven? six. Wayun six is the Wayun who does an enormous amount of interactions with the Breen, isn't he? Or is that Wayun seven? I believe that's. Seven, because I believe Wayun six. Oh, he ends up one. in a shuttlecraft with Odo. Yes, right. So Wei, I think. Well, he's a and great Wei-Yun Wei-Yun five seven, is the one who dies great. in the shuttle accident. That's right. Demar. Yeah, so I Wayun think five was a great man. Wayun seven, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike you, defective. It's like I'm not defective. Odo doesn't think I'm defective, do you, Odo? <laughs> I'm just like I don't understand this at all. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. a great episode. What a great he character. Asks, he asks for uh, Odo's blessing as he's dying. And, yeah. yeah, that's a good. That's a touching. I don't, that's a good. That's faith, treachery in the great river. I believe. That's oh, what a great fan. episode. That's a fully loaded episode of awesome. Yeah, this sort of what what is the feeling when you're when you find yourself in the position of being someone's god, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's not really something you never thought of as a career option before. Oh, is it, um, is it the 
is it the first time we see Wayun, or is it maybe the first time we see the next Wayun where he's just like eating and he's just staring at the crew that are eating because Odo's there. He's actually just staring at Odo. And Odo's just like, why does he keep staring at us? They're like, he's staring at you. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, well, why is he doing that? He's like, well, why don't you go ask him or whatever? And he walks over there and he's just like, how can I serve you, Odo? He's like, you mean if I ask you to go away, you will? He's like, yes, but first, hear me out. You know? Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Some good way you use. Great character. A brilliant, tactical evil in his own way, but also capable of surprising mercy at times, you know? But everything was always directed toward the world. Or maybe not. Whatever it was. Extra cruelty. I don't know about mercy. He's not like one of these characters that just wants to be extra cruel because he gets... Yeah, yeah. If if he doesn't see a need in hurting you, he's not going to do it. No. But if he does, he'll just break you to smithereens if he has to. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. (sighs) Yeah. Just like the founders. (laughs) Yeah, precisely. Destroy every Cardassian. Like, which ones? She's like, all of them. Just all of them. Oh, a monster. She was a monster. Yeah, man. What a crazy ending that one. Oh, no, she... Well, they take her in. She pays yeah. for her crimes they, she goes to a federation yeah. jail i think interesting there's a story to pick up yeah no kidding that'd be a great comic series they, they're eternal as far as we know right or at least super super long lived yeah, i don't they know just how gonna long keep her in this jail cell for a, the yeah like what it what 10, is the, years. what is the jail term for like attempted genocide of a quadrant yeah that's how do you how do you constrain that within a theory of law that would even be adequate to it maybe the the, wow. the length of an eternal life is a good start yeah maybe <laughs> so eh I don't know. cripes i love the yeah. scene too with way even though where he's just like laughing at cisco and uh ducat bickering and then he just someone drops poison to kill ducat or whatever and <laughs> way even just drinks it oh yeah like, he's like oh my that's quite toxic <laughs> <laughs> when he's sampling every food from the uh, from the dispenser. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. And because he, he likes the different textures, because he can't really taste them. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, like the one too. It, I think it's way even seven too, like one of the more evil ones. But it's where he's <laughs> talking to Cisco, and he's just talking about how something like that, how the, one of their deficiencies. It was it was the eyesight, maybe or the oh right something like that. And Cisco's just like, well, maybe did you think that maybe they were wrong? For not giving you that or taste buds or whatever it was. He says, nope. Gods don't make mistakes. And then he just sort of trails off. He's just like, though, I do think it would be nice to be able to carry a tune. <laughs> like he says like a, yeah. a genuine thing like that every now and then. That yeah. He has his anyway. way. He's not afraid of honesty in that sense, right? No. It's just not the only thing he'll do. Uh, he can be honest, it's not like something that. you could use against him. Yeah, precisely. Right. If he can use it to build a bond or a bridge with you, sure, he'll he'll share that way. Absolutely. But yeah, Wayun, any other uh, great Wayun moments or things you'd like to say about Wayun? Hmm. It's another... I do. It, it always did make me wonder what the limit of a clone series was with the with the with the series, because there seemed to be some implied limit that the last Wayun had actually died. Yeah, because they destroyed all their cloning facilities. In this in the, quadrant. In this quadrant. And that was... Yeah. Oh. So yeah, it assumes there's more Wayunes over in the Gamma Quadrant. Or Delta, uh, yeah. Though she uh, does say it's her last Wayun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they only seem to make one at a time. I, I guess maybe the only samples of his DNA... Yeah, maybe the only stock to make him from was in there, right? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that in that sense, it's not an unreasonable thing. I mean, the Heineken Company does the same thing with its yeast, right? They have the stock in Amsterdam and then or wherever it goes, and then it goes out to the other places in the world, they make it from there. Hmm. Uh, but they control strictly the production of the yeast itself, right? Which would make sense in terms of an imperial control strategy to make control the seed stock or whatever the genetic stock was hmm. and only put out a certain number of samples at one time to uh, trusted founders who are taking them somewhere to set up and make your people. It's more but that would mean there's got to be a catalog somewhere in the Great Link They've got to have some sort of catalog or index you can flip through of what sort of clones you need. Yeah, they don't have it sitting in a database or a piece of paper somewhere. Yeah, I'm assuming it's in the Great Link. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if they have a very photographic memory that Odo never really talked about. 
I would wonder. He would certainly use that as an advantage, I'm sure. Mm. It's, it's the subtle differences in these characters, too, because Tehran and Weyun and a couple of the other ones we're going to talk about later, or maybe, mm-hmm. or, or maybe just Pank, who we'll get to here in a minute, could have come off far more similar, mm-hmm. uh, coming from the same actor with the same voice and all that sort of thing, because they do have similar voices. This and he's got a very distinctive voice. But but they're very different, the way he delivers these characters characters that are all characters who are just trying to be sort of subtly evil so they're all sort of the same sort of character he does it no you're right he he, uh, he he, he's very good at bringing a sort of different life to each of these characters and you think with a voice as distinctive as his that he would sort of give the game away every time but he's able to bring out different qualities even in that i find from character to character and he can Um, uh, can it's got to help to have ferengi teeth in your face though too it it must you know, it, like it's got to change the way you shape all the your same words. Time. Oh yeah, I mean, like it's a creative <laughs> blockage. I'd hope. <laughs> I, I remember hearing in in something Armin Shimmerman saying that because you know he did those meetups on the weekend or whatever where all the Ferengi would practice their lines together and stuff. Oh yeah, which I think they mentioned in the the great documentary, uh, what we left behind. Right. Uh, and he said they had to do that because once you get the teeth in and the makeup and everything, it's just all too distracting. And if you don't like over practice, then you can't really deliver on the oh, level that, right. they, that they always did on Deep Space Nine somehow. Right. Well, the next character, I suppose, that we see him play, Officer Kevin Mulcahy. Oh, yeah. A memorable maybe, jerk. Like, <laughs> maybe not the most evil of all these characters, but maybe the least nice. He's not yeah. a nice man. Uh, no, no, he has few redeeming <laughs> features as we see him in the episode. Um, I guess yeah, he's, he's, chief, he's Chief Kevin Mulcahy. I think he calls him Chief, the uh, Dukat's um, character. Uh, responsible for beatings and threatenings and hasslings and stomping on pictures and, and killing all the, sorts uh, of... Jimmy the Thief. That's right, the, the the beating death of Jimmy the Thief, wasn't it? Or shooting death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And nearly of Benny Russell. That's right. But just yeah. like the way they hassle him, too, is just so mean. Like when they're just stepping all over his picture for no reason. And just like, where'd you get yeah. that suit? Very real. Well, it, uh, it highlights historical. really brilliantly the, the sorts of systemic aggression that could go from that very overt scale down to you know, very subliminal scales of just ease of access and can you get insurance? Can you get a bank loan? Can, you know, small business loans, like anything like that. Can you get looked at the same way by an employer? All sorts of things, right? And this is the kind of grit that that episode brings in really beautifully. Uh, he's a very big piece of grit. Yeah. That's for sure. What a nasty character. Which of Again, brilliantly about... played though and, and doesn't oh. really resemble anybody else that he plays, I don't think, in... Star Trek. No, no. He really stands out as just a very almost archetypically nasty authority figure. Yeah, or even in movies and stuff that I've seen, I mean, he doesn't play a character like this that I've seen. Like um the reanimator, uh Herbert West is more like Tehran or Weyun or Pank or one of these guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny, they give him the the, the Irish name for the paddy wagon, <laughs> Kevin Mulcahy. <laughs> yeah. That's right. uh, yeah they're very much highlighting even with that yeah the uh the racialized character of the whole yeah. context yeah and uh i suppose the next time we see the great jeffrey combs is in star trek voyager right as pink what a now, guy this, this one i'm probably going to be the most negative about um I love so voyager. is dwayne johnson <laughs> does he not love he this either he's famously positive about a lot of things yeah he was like this almost made me consider quit acting it's his first role acting. yeah he was like it was it just it was he found it apparently very difficult it was uh, a bad yeah. episode it's maybe the worst of voyager definitely one of them uh, yeah and at pank as i recall is that the manager of the tsunkatsi tsunkatsi yeah he's the yeah warden kind of of the yeah but also he's sort of promoter he's the, he's the the vince mcmahon the dana white and the that's uh, right them all rolled into one and, and some warden and and yeah. slaver um yeah thoroughly nasty character again but but they don't give him a lot and it's kind of a cliche 
most cliche character of all the Jeffrey Combs characters. See, I'm not a fan. I think this episode, not only is it bad, but it is a waste of Jeffrey Combs. Like, if you're only going to bring Jeffrey Combs onto Voyager once, what a waste. Now, my theory behind that is that they knew this was bad. For some reason, this script huh. got greenlit. They knew it was bad, or once it started being filmed, well, no, it would have to have been before. Yeah, they knew it was bad, or somebody did. So they're like, we have to throw everything at the wall. We have to bring in Dwayne The Rock Johnson. We have to get Jeffrey Combs to play this meaningless character. We have oh, to get... I see. We need to just like load this with ringers to try and pull it through. Yeah, in which he does. I see what he saying. delivers his l- lines and makes that character sure, as real as you can. But sure, it just there's, there's just not a lot of meat to work with there. I don't and the that. other saving grace is that episode is they also bring in um JG Hertzler to play the Herogen that trains oh, seven right. and nine, and he's really right. good. So he's I he's the highlight of that. the episode, really. But... Again, another actor we could do this with too. Oh, we'll Hertzler. we'll get we'll get to JG. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll get, have a, to get, we'll get a supplemental. Turn. Um, you want to hear more about Kevin Mulcahy? We might touch on it more in our first supplemental. Far beyond the kaleidoscope. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you discussed we that episode time. at length. Yeah, yeah. Was like, I don't have a lot there. more to say about Sunkatsi or Pank. No, let's uh, let's move along yeah, home from there. I don't know what their point was with that whole episode. <laughs> we have to fill 26 episodes in this season. Uh, yeah. Go back to the episode idea I had, guys. Now... Uh, I think the next time we see him is in a whole different series, isn't it? It certainly is. Yeah, yeah. One of my... Uh, no, this is as... Uh, this is a series one episode we first see him is. Do we first see him in Pajem? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're not not the shadows of Pajem, because that's the second Pajem episode. Whatever the episode's called where they first discover that underground Vulcan listening. Yeah, exactly. That's not Shadows yeah. of Pajem. That's uh No, that's um I forget the name of the episode. Just a second. But the Andorian the... Incident. Yeah, the Andorian Incident. Great episode. Every Strand episode is good. I just rewatched them all in preparation for this and I enjoyed enjoyed them all immensely. Oh he he goes from uh oh, brilliantly a uh, hard villain to uh an equally fierce ally over the course of that series. It's great. Yeah, and I don't. I wouldn't go so far myself as to say hard villain. The thing I like about Shran upon this rewatch is he's just really complex, but never comes off to me as a villain. He. Often oh, I mean, seems... in terms of the first episode where he arrives, he's oh, 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 sure, they're right. just like shooting at them and whatever, and like, oh yeah, and he's like beating yeah, yeah, people yeah. up. And, oh yeah. yeah, oh fair, fair. I see. What he's definitely doing. like coming in as a big tough guy mode. Yeah, in, uh, yeah, in yeah. The Andorian incident. Yeah, but yeah, he doesn't. Moment. That's not the only note they ever play with him. You're absolutely right. He no, they no. they come at him in a lot of different angles. To me, he's the most crucial character in that show as far as the initial forming of the Federation goes. Like, the the show and the time travel stuff with Daniels and stuff all wants you to believe uh-huh. that that's Archer. If you remove him from that uh, uh-huh. timeline or that process, it all falls apart. But yeah. Shran, what really kicks off the Federation is when Shran asks Archer to be that mediator b- between he and the Vulcans. Yes, because they, because they have Vulcan hostages. They've taken this is Shadows of Pajem, where they yes. take the Vulcan hostages. Yeah, yeah. And they need to negotiate on that initial triad of Andorian, Vulcan, and human comes together there in that sense. I see what you mean. But what they're fighting over in this episode with the mediation is there's just that planet like on the yeah. outskirts of both their territories. It. It, it, uh, the Andorians did settle it briefly and then got. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've just landed uh, troops there a number of times. Ejected by the, the Vulcans. Like, I think Shran says his older brother fought in that campaign where they went to go yeah, I think try so. to fend off the Vulcans. But that's the initial step. It's just like wanting that mediation. And like he's mm-hmm. he's the only one cooperating, or at least cooperating the most with Archer. The Vulcans are being very adversarial. Um, Saval. And, you know, oh, yeah. Eventually, eventually Saval goes down and they try to do a whole thing and Shran tortures of all, I think, at one point. But <laughs> so it, you, I like see what that, you mean. Yeah. They he gets hard. They definitely can show him as He's, a hard They definitely show him as a battle hardened, like special forces kind of military guy mm-hmm. who ends up in larger commands. You know, he's he's commanding a strike force, he's commanding ships, he's eventually commanding groups of ships, I think. 
Uh, Murray, toward, I believe his ship's called. I think so. Yeah. So First I mean, it's, he's it's class. he's definitely sort of their Captain Archer that way in terms of a figure who's implicit in the beginning of the Federation. But yeah, if he hadn't been willing to play ball, the Federation would have remained the Vulcans and the humans sort of puttering around through parts of the cosmos, you know? Mm -hmm. It would have been a very different reality. He has a soft spot for Archer, obviously. But but I love the flip-flopping between their thing. Like, first he does Archer a favor. Or no, Archer does him a favor by discovering the listening post yes and then he does archer a favor by saving him he breaks him like out of a prison or he was being held captive and he rescues yeah. him and you know he's just like we're even and then he shows up to help him in another instance with uh the zindi i believe yep or maybe it's yep. before that I'm, I'm forgetting an episode i think because he's just like you tell archer he owes me now maybe it is in the zindi <laughs> one because he, you know he they follow them into the expanse and yeah but it's again a bit of treachery because they just want to steal the weapon and at one point they do and then oh you know, yeah Archer, well it's interesting it right? Cause, uh, in, the, in a certain way shran is uh i hadn't really thought about this before but he has a a niche in that program similar to ducat on deep space nine but he doesn't come with the same baggage as Ducat does, right? He's, he's not a, a sort of like yeah, like he's not a sort of megalomaniacal, vicarious trauma weirdo who has this paternalistic relationship. He's going to do all this crazy stuff and then go mad at Benjamin Cisco and just go nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has that on again, off again, friend enemy relationship with the principal character of the program that sort of slots him in there but in a really mm -hmm. different way right yeah where, they're trying to be friends they're trying to yeah where one is the sort of cosmic struggle of good and evil this is actually uh the difficulties of that i love that theme of yeah Enterprise. they didn't do enough of it i felt like but yeah like those... the possibilities that are there what can grow out of conflict you know yeah and this is initial interactions between you know the andorians and the tellerites and all these early the cordons yeah and, yeah and, and that type of thing and the difficulties in bringing them together initially and stuff i mean they do that plot in in the end of the show by the end of the show but i yeah. feel like they could have committed more time to that like the the, the smaller moments of that because some of the yeah, best moments those, are when they're just trying to be together, political right? with the Tellarites, or even with the Andorians, like any other. Your ship is and small and off. unimpressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's oh great. man. Just, yeah. I like when Hoshi's briefing him on it too. It's like, look, Tellarites will complain about everything. It's their way of starting a, a confrontation with you. So they'll, they'll just complain about things. Like it'll be too cold, too small, that every all that kind of stuff. In He's like, well, what if they don't have anything to complain about? She's like, oh, well, then they'll just insult you. <laughs> but at least they try the polite way the first. Confrontation. Yeah, oh, yeah. They're, they're not going to be satisfied without that. Uh, that's awesome. I just yeah. love when he tells the, uh, both Tran and I forget the Tellerite ambassador's name, but he tells them both mm. they need to start acting like humans for a change. Oh, yeah. And, and, and like the Tellerite, like he's like, you just have to stop being argumentative and Shran, Shran, you have to stop being so proud or whatever. And uh, the Tellerite can't help himself. He's just like, well, I guess we've fallen quite far then, haven't we? Like, is that not what I just told you not to do? Can you just like stop? Just stop for one second. He's like, I know. Oh, I, my butt's big and my nose is stupid. I don't know. I know. He's like, I know. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, we've got time. Take about 20% off the top there, eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, just a great character. And Archer has to cut off his antenna. And that kind of ends their beef, their whole back and forth beef. Oh, yeah. That's a great it's, episode. I love the great episode Because Talus dies, his his love interest yeah. in that. And she was awesome. I liked Talus. Yeah, she's uh, awesome. So, I love the Andorians. I, I'm they're, glad they're a species Enterprise, that I just, every appearance is great. Yeah, I'm glad Enterprise gave us a lot more of them. Really, I, we need a series that gives us a lot of the Bolians. I want to learn more about the Bolian. Star Trek, Ricks. Is he dead? He didn't die in that, did he? Oh, I think uh, he did. Didn't he? Yeah. Captain Ricks. That's not going to It would happen. all be classic old first season TNG uniforms the whole time. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, the it's actors prequel. would not work for more than one episode before quitting. The, the, <laughs> the TNG prequel, Captain Ricks. That's right. 
We'll just end yeah, with them. We're just get, getting this signal to go to that planet. Have Walker Keel in there. Oh, man. <laughs> Walker Keel. Yeah. yeah, man. Walker Keel. Now, the next time we see Jeffrey Combs is still in Enterprise. And this is a, a character I love. One of the, I think, the, the most, of all these characters, the most underrated for sure. And that's Krem. Now, Krem is the Ferengi in the Enterprise episode. Oh, right. Four Ferengi. And they're never named. So then in TNG, when they're like, we're going to go meet the Ferengi for the first time, it's because they didn't know who they were. Asher didn't know who they were. Right. But That's fun. But he ends up sharing all of his scenes pretty much with Krem. Archer does and he's just he's kind of like a rom kind of character like he's the complete opposite of a brunt so he's playing a Ferengi again and you know uh, they have Ethan Phillips playing one and uh, Clint Howard it's quite the honor yeah yeah and I think oh Clint Howard's Ferengi is is wonderful he's pretty funny too he just keeps jabbing Archer in the ribs with his (laughs) butt of his gun just like whenever Archer just relaxes for a second he's just like (laughs) And he's the traitorous one. Like it all him and him and Phillips is Ferengi don't really oh, yeah. get along and kind of squabble. And uh Krem is Ethan Phillips' Ferengi, who I can't remember his name, his cousin. Mm-hmm. And he handles all his business affairs and they make they make him do all the uh manual labor. And he's just he's just funny. Him, him and Archer Archer trying to figure out how their whole thing works, and then he starts playing Krem against the rest of them. Just by being nicer to him, you know, he's just, yeah, <laughs> and telling him that you know he can take over. Like, he's like, "I'll help you. We'll get rid of those three, throw them in the brig. You can have the ship, and I'll take these guys to jail or whatever." But it's funny, like Archer makes him go get him water and a sandwich at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you like working for your cousin? She's like, "Oh, my cousin's a skillful merchant. I'm learning a lot from him." <laughs> he's, he's kind of this nice guy even though he's like not getting a proper share and doing all <laughs> here i am casually stealing a starship da, yeah da, da. yeah, no, oh, I, yeah. I, I like Krim a lot everyone should go watch that episode um i forget the name of it off the top of my head but it's the, the ferengi episode of enterprise you can find yeah it. i like their costumes as well because they're clearly like there's no they're not an organized ferengi vessel they're just like out there in their ship trying to make their way in the world today you know uh, and, and the second time Ethan Phillips plays a Ferengi, if you count when he's Neelix acting as the uh, grand proxy. Oh, that's when funny. they have to go get those two Ferengi off the the planet from the Barjan wormhole. That's yeah, right. Wormhole. What a great! That was one of the Voyager's great pickups. Honestly, the one thing they really could. I like that. One yeah. of the ones they could pick up from TNG, you know, because they do mention in TNG that it does go to the Delta Quadrant. They. Yeah, like they're stuck yeah. in the Delta Quadrant for a Which is one of the few mentions the Delta Quadrant really gets ever. Oh, prior to Voyager, Voyager. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They uh, probably picked up every thread they could as far as that was kind of... Well, not. yeah, I mean, all three of them. <laughs> all three? What are the other two? <laughs> ah, forget about it. We don't have time for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think the next time we see Jeffrey Combs is actually in a video game, which I haven't played, Star Trek Elite Force 2, where he plays a Does position play you enjoy... Uh, a Romulan, Romulan commander. commander. Uh, he plays oh, yeah. Romulan commander Soldok. Doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yeah, there's a lot of intrigue in that game, as I recall. I gotta go back and play some of these old Star Trek games. They're so, probably great stories. I'll start with the Super Nintendo Deep Space. As far Nintendo. as I know, I think that one actually, if I recall, doesn't that one actually have that may sport somebody else coming back and Who's voicing that? the character as well? Elite Force Two. Oh yeah, I believe yeah, uh, Leonard Nimoy might it's... be in that one. Oh, right on. I think. Was what I read. You're That'd right. There cool. are a couple other. Oh no! You know who is in that one? Um, uh, Tuvok is in that. Oh, one. right on, Tim Russ. Man. Mm-hmm. Oh man, uh, legend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, you know what? We skipped a character. In and that fact, was that. there was in fact one character between Officer Kevin Mulcahy and Pank in the <sighs> very last episode of Deep Space Nine. Really. In the um, scene in Vix, the kind of the big ending scene in Vix, he's a patron. He, really? He's in the background. You can see him. Oh, yeah. right on. He's walking around. I'm assuming he doesn't get any dialogue, but. No, he's just a guy. That, he's, he's just, just he's like just a there. random hologram. <laughs> he's Officer Kevin Mulcahy. He's, he's coming for the night. <laughs> being nice. Exactly. He's just having a nice time over there, not but being he can't horrible. can't take to his anyone. eye off of Cisco. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that guy looking at me? 
That's, That's precisely Kevin. Mind not him. Kevin Mulcahy. <laughs> just Kev. Uh, but of course, the next true appearance we see is yeah. Agamus the Evil Computer. Oh, right. In, in Lower Decks. And it's a fantastic appearance. I love Agamus. Nobody plays an evil computer like Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> he just tries to be your friend. He's just like, all right, do what I say, and I'll give you candy. Like, he'll just, like, try anything. Like, he'll, 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 if, if his one scam doesn't work, he'll just say something else to you to try to get him to, like... Because he just wants to be tapped into the system of the shit so he it. can control it. Just, like, well, just if you tap in. me into the systems, I can do that work you're doing at five times the speed you're doing it right now and think of all the things you can do with that time and like you'll try like little ways like that <laughs> agamus is fantastic i hope we see him again in in lower decks oh possibly one of my favorite oh definitely one of them maybe my favorite villain character in, in lower decks wait but till I, he I and like badgie meet up uh, i like him way better than badgie uh, wow. i guess that brings us all to the end of all these characters uh, I think so. The many faces of Jeffrey Combs. Your thoughts as we can summarize all of these characters now that we've uncovered them all and briefly well, touched on their stories. I uh I was trying to think what's my my favorite Jeffrey Combs, Combs moment. moment. Ooh, that is a good way to end. Um well it's obviously gotta be the guy walking around the, the Vix. That's pretty great. I only just learned about it, so I probably had a different one in my mind. Okay, <laughs> go back and watch it. You're gonna. You I'm gonna. Know. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna have to check that You're out. Gonna now. be on the edge of your uh, seat. You know, I think. I think my uh, my favorite Coombs appearance has still got to be that second episode uh, with Shran, where he starts to realize what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, like when when their relationship actually really begins to turn. I think that may be my favorite Combs moment. In, the one uh, that's and he has one. to just redefine the situation so quickly, right? It's great. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite Combs character? Cripes. Wow. Well, I'll let you think about that. Well, I say my yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the thing I don't like about Shran is they overuse the pink skin thing too much. Like he says it constantly. It's kind of um, obvious. Like they, I don't know, they, they because he has blue skin. Call people pink skin. It's just a bit too obvious for me. It wasn't clever writing. I didn't find, it, and they use mm -hmm. it a lot. And it's not not even accurate to describe humans. Just because Scott Bakula has a pinkish hue, like it, it, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> he's ruddy cheeked. Yeah. Yes. Well, he's just um, a rosy cheeked fella for sure. <laughs> cherubic. I think my favorite <laughs> Shran moment, though. I think it is going to be a Shran moment. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing about the Andorian Mining Consortium, where he's, he says they're looking for Archerite in the Expanse. Cause they, oh, right. Because they up on Degra and them. Degra's like, get out of here now. This is a test site and all this stuff. He's just like, oh, we we're looking for Archerite. And if you've got any, uh, it's worth a pretty good price. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. And then it's like, get out of here now, we'll destroy your ship. And he's just like, well, that's not very accommodating. It's like, you've just <laughs> lost yourself out on a tidy profit. Yeah, I love that one. Oh, I'd forgotten all about that. That is a great moment. Uh... This is, the moment is also pretty good. Where he's telling Archer about how Talos attacked him because the female Andorian's uh, romantic overtures are a bit more aggressive than humans. He's like, so I had, I was left with the decision. I had to charge her with Assaulting a superior officer or mate with her. And I always got Archer's line wrong. I always thought he said you made the right decision, but I just watched it again. And that's not what he says. He says, I hope you made the right decision, <laughs> <laughs> which is way better line. How's that working out for you? Buddy? Yeah, how's that working? <laughs> you could, you could have just spent 20 minutes in the brig or like a couple hours. Or... <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, I liked it, he says. Mm -hmm. uh, now, your favorite yeah. uh, the Jeffy Combs character. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'll go first. I'll go first. For me, it's the, a lot of my favorite Jeffy Combs moments are of Fran. Mm -hmm. I still like Brunt a little bit more. I, 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 oh, I, yeah? I, I do love me some... Brunt! F-C-A. F-C-A. Uh, Wayun's great. They're all... Uh, they're great. I love Krem, but I, I do have yeah. a soft spot for the Ferengi and a Brunt. Honestly, I do. I, I think it's it's going to have to be Shran for me. He's, he's just such a he's great, way more depth of a character. Yeah, he's, he's a better so much character. Time to develop him. 
I will concede yeah, he's and a he's, better character. He's got. Though. I think he's got more dimension than Wei Yun. I think, and so. I think be, because he he's allowed to, right? Wei Yun being a clone, he's just restarting all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, and the flatness of Wei Yun, I think, is actually part of the point. Just as you were talking about with the, oh. the senses earlier, mm. but uh, yeah, Shran gets to be like full throttle, one hundred and fifty percent all the time, with high test fuel. So, uh, yeah, what a great what a great space to let him just kind of chew scenery in. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. All, All right. right. Looks like we've uh, gone from Oxnard and back again. There we are. So, as is our usual way, Oxnard to Deep Space Nine and back. That's right. <laughs> it's not quite a Hobbit's tale, but it's a. I don't think he is very tall, but anyway. Uh, there we are. No, but he sings in that group of the Star Trek actors that sing. Does he? They call themselves, you know, him and Vaughn Armstrong and uh, Max Grudenchik and. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know this existed. That's going to be my Biggs. evening now. <laughs> oh yeah, they're they're good singers. Oh, I've just lost the rest of my night. There we go. Oh man, and transmission. Um.